Okay, let's try to wrap up this review. This is part three. We're going to mainly talk about equilibrium here on part three. Um, first, we're going to write about, or we're going to discuss, shifting equilibrium. We can either shift to the right, which favors the products, um, or we can shift to the left, which uh, favors the reactants. Now, we can do this a couple of different ways. There's a simplistic way, but there's another way we can do it by using what's called the equilibrium expression. Now, the equilibrium expression for this reaction that I have here is, of course, products over reactants. So that's water vapor and carbon monoxide concentration on top, and then hydrogen and carbon dioxide on the bottom. And we know that the only thing that changes this constant is temperature. So that means if I make something in the numerator get bigger, something in the denominator has to get bigger right along with it. So the equilibrium constant stays constant. So that would mean if something in the denominator gets bigger, remember we have products on top, reactants on the bottom. So I'd be pushing the equilibrium towards the reactant side, which would be a shift left. Think about that another way. What if I removed some water vapor? If you remove water vapor, your numerator is getting smaller, right? So that means we have to make it uh, still be the same constant, so I have to make the denominator get smaller at the same time. So we would take some of these guys and move them uh, into the product to make my numerator compensate for that, and my product would be favored here, so we'd say a shift to the right. Now another way to consider this is just simply when you place a stress upon the system, remember the system needs to shift to, to alleviate that stress. So another way to think of it is this. If I add CO, so letter A, if I'm adding CO, won't I have to shift left to use what I've added? Think about that. If this gets bigger, I'm going to shift left to get rid of what I've just added. And of course that'll create more reactants. So by adding something on the product side that's a gas or something dissolved in water, it will push that equilibrium to the reactant side. So we would say it's shifted left. Now using our equilibrium expression, if this number gets bigger, CO, right, for our constant to stay constant, doesn't our product side have to get bigger as well? And our, or excuse me, our denominator have to get bigger as well. And our denominator represents the reactants which once again is verifying that I'm shifting left. Now let's take a look at adding water. Water is a vapor, so it will affect the equilibrium when I add it or take it away. If it were a liquid or solid, it wouldn't, but it's a vapor here. So if I add water, wouldn't that also shift the equilibrium to the left to get rid of what I just added? Once again, look at our equilibrium expression. If this gets bigger, right, don't my reactants have to get bigger right along with it? So I would shift it to the left to make those get bigger. The addition of a catalyst. Now some might call that a trick question. A catalyst does not affect the equilibrium shifting. It gets you there sooner, but it does not shift it to the right or to the left. It just gets you there sooner. Now changing temperature will, will actually change the expression constant and it will shift the equilibrium at the same time. Now this reaction has a positive delta H. That means heat is a reactant. It's endothermic. So delta H is positive. We're adding heat. It's an endothermic process. So now if I increase the temperature, use our little analogy. Remember we have that little girl that's hot or cold. She needs to either go towards or away from the fire. In this case, we're increasing the temperature on her. She's going to get hot, so she's going to run away from the fire, and she will shift to the right. Now, by the way, when there's a temperature change and it shifts to the right, that means the equilibrium constant will get slightly bigger also. That's the only variable that can change the value of the equilibrium constant. And then the last one, if I decrease the volume of the container, that's the same as increasing the pressure. Now remember, increasing the pressure will favor the side with less gas. Now in this one, I have two gases on the left, two moles of gases on the right, so as a result, there is no shift this time. Increasing pressure, or decreasing volume, the same thing, will favor the side with fewer moles of gases. Remember that. Therefore, by the way, increasing the volume, or decreasing the pressure, 
would favor the side with less moles of gas. All right, for number 10, I don't think I need to do too many of these. It sort of becomes busy work here. We've done a bunch of these in class. Um, so I'm just going to do a couple before I, I move on to another problem. And you can do the others and check with me if you have a question. But I just want to write the equilibrium constant for this, for these reactions. So for letter A, KEQ would be products over reactants. So I have NO2, and I can measure it in concentration units because it's a gas to the fourth power, but I'm going to leave water out because that's a liquid, and I can't measure its value in um, moles per liter. On the other side, I have ammonia, and it's a gas, so I can include that in my equilibrium expression. And remember, the coefficients become the exponents in your equilibrium expression. We also have oxygen, which is a gas on the reactant side, and that would be to the seventh power. So that's the equilibrium expression for letter A. Let's do letter B. KEQ equals, remember we can include gases and things dissolved in water. Liquids and solids we leave out. So I have H3O plus concentration to the first power and CN negative to the first power. These are both dissolved in water and of course we can measure their concentration in moles per liter, which is what those brackets represent. On the other side, my reactants, I have HCN concentration to the first power. And once again, I'm going to leave water out. It's a liquid, so it's not part of this expression. Okay, let me just do one more quickly for you, just to make sure you've got it. So KEQ for the third one. Both of my products are gases, so I can include them. PCL3 and Cl2 concentrations. And my reactant's a gas. It says plus something. There's a typo there. So that's just PCL5. And we're done with the third one. Okay? You can work on the others, and if you guys have questions, come see me, but they're pretty straightforward. We also learn how to calculate the value of the equilibrium constant. So here we have an equilibrium reaction, and here are the equilibrium concentrations. So from this, we can calculate the numerical value of K. Let's write the expression first. Water, it's a vapor this time, so I can include it, times CO concentration over H2 and CO2. So 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, so there are no exponents other than the ones that are not written there. And then we can just plug and chug. Water vapor is 0.5 molar. Looks like we only have one significant figure there. CO is 3.0 molar. H2 is 1.5 molar. And CO2 is 2.5 molar. So let's plug and chug and see what we get here. We'll clear this out from some of the other things we've been doing. So we have 0.5 times 3 divided by 1.5. And we'll divide that by 2.5, enter, and we're only allowed one significant figure, so the equilibrium constant for this reaction would be 0.4. Now that's smaller than 1, so remember what that tells us. That means the amount of product compared to the reactant is smaller. Okay? All right, one more question, and this is the one I bet you've all been waiting for. We like to call these ice problems. And this would be very similar to one you might see on your exam. We've done several of these in class and for homework, so you can refer to your notes and your homework for this. And you can watch the videos that we've done before uh, on this as well. So here's my reaction. I want to find the equilibrium concentration of everything um, once equilibrium has been established. I give you the number of moles of reactant and the volume of the container, and I give you the equilibrium constant. So we'll set up our ice diagram. Hopefully you guys are really good at this now. My initial concentration is not 0.5. It's 0.5 divided by 2. Remember, it's moles per liter. So 0.5 divided by 2 is 0.25 molar. My iodine's the same thing, 0.25 molar. And I haven't made any product yet. Now remember, my reactants go down. And it's a 1 to 1 to 2 ratio. So my reactant's going to go down by a number I don't know yet. So I'm going to call it x. 
and this reactant will go down by the same amount. Once again, a one-to-one -one ratio. My products go up, and this is a one-to-one-to-two -one -to -two ratio, so my product goes up by a factor of 2x. At equilibrium, I have 0.25 minus x, 0.25 minus x, and 2x. The next step is to write the equilibrium expression. So we have HI concentration squared, coefficients 2 there, so that becomes the exponent in the expression, all over H2 concentration and I2 concentration. And then we're going to go ahead and plug and chug. My equilibrium constant is given 2.0 times 10 to the negative second. I'm going to write that as 0 0.020, if that's okay with you, equals my HI concentration I know in terms of X, and that's 2X. My H2 and I2 are both 0.25 minus X. Now, I'm not going to make you use the quadratic on the exam. I promise you that. So we know we can take the square root of both sides. So we have this in terms of x, not x squared. So let's see what the square root of 0 0.020 is. So I'm going to press my square root button, 0 0.020, and I get 0 0.14. Okay, so 0 0.14 is the square root of that. And then the other side, of course, I hope we can do without our calculators. 2x quantity squared, the square root of that is 2x. 0.25 minus x and 0.25 minus x. The square root of that is simply 0.25 minus x. Then we'll clear our denominator. So we have 0.14 times 0.25 minus x equals, up oh, yes, 0.25 minus x equals 2x. Then we'll distribute. So 0.14, and I'm not going to round the answer in my calculator yet, so I'm going to use my 0.14142, and we'll round to two sig figs at the very end, times 0.25 is 0 0.035 so far, so 0 0.035, and 0 0.14 times a negative x is a negative 0.14x, and that all equals 2x. Almost done. We'll combine like terms now. So we have 0 0.035 equals 2.14 x's. Divide both sides by 2.14. And it looks like x is going to be a pretty tiny number. So I'm going to take that number I had in here earlier, not rounded, and we'll divide it by 2.14. And now we're going to round off to two sig figs, 0 0.017. So that is what x is equal to. And we thought it would be small because our equilibrium constant, or is it, is very small. Now let's wrap it up. My H2 and I2 concentrations are going to be the same. And remember that was 0.25 minus x from our ice diagram. So in this case it's 0.25 minus 0.017. Now we're going to have to round this off to the nearest hundredth here. So 0.25 minus 0 0.017 gives us point 0.2, oh, yes, point 0.23, we're going to have to stop at point 0.23, aren't we? Molar. So that's the concentration of my H2. It didn't go down by very much, did it? And we didn't expect it to go down by very much because our constant was pretty small, meaning we have lots of reactant left over. My HI concentration according to our ice diagram, is 2x. So we have 2 times 0 0.017, which is 0 0.034, which is a very small number relative to the concentration of my reactants. Now, hopefully this helped you. You will have one very similar to this on the test. If you still don't get it, review your notes. Do the ones in your textbook. Review the videos that we've done earlier. Okay? This will be the toughest one you have. All right, that wraps up our review. Um, study hard, and uh, if you don't get something, please just don't um, forget about it. I mean, get some desire. Get some excitement. Try to learn these things. They're really not that bad. Come see me if you have questions. Have a great night and good luck. Bye-bye.